growing up. I'm not, I'm not sure if you knew this or not, uh, but we are starting a relationship series where we're going to be talking about uh, sex and dating and relationships and, and, and what God has to say about it. And so uh, if you came in here unprepared for that, uh, I apologize, but you are now stuck and there's nothing that you can do about it. Um, uh, but uh, so many times people ask, hey, what, why are we talking about this? Uh, why are we bringing it up? Why, why are we talking about it at church? And man, I feel like it's so valuable because I remember when I was your age, uh, when I was a middle school and high school student, and I didn't have someone telling me about what the Bible said about it. I didn't have someone giving me a framework to think about it. Uh, and, and so I, I had to listen to ideas uh, in movies and on TV and from my friends. And listen, my friends are dumb. They didn't know what was going on either. And so I'm trying to understand all of the stuff uh, and I didn't have a lot of truth behind it. Like I, I even remember like my first real relationship. I was a freshman in high school and, and I, I saw this girl and I liked her and somehow she liked me too. And so I'm like, all right, I've done it. I have a girlfriend. I have arrived. I have, I have done the thing that I'm supposed to do. And, and I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do now. And so we talked to each other and we had some classes together and we sat at lunch together. And then three weeks later, she broke up with me because I never hold her hand. I was like, you're supposed to hold their hand. Why didn't anyone tell me about this? No one is telling me these things. What am I supposed to do? And I, I didn't have a framework to think. And uh, man, I began to feel things. And I, I didn't know what to do. I was like, man, I, I think this person is attractive. What, what do I do with that? And I remember as I got older and I began to date, I'm like, how do I know who to date? Like, how, how do I know the type of person that's going to be my person? And, and I just didn't have a lot of good information about that. And man, I, my, my hope for you and my hope for this series um, is that we would begin giving you a framework to think about some of these things, that we can look at what God's word says and that we could see true things in here and that you would be able to think rightly about them. Uh, maybe for you, you, you've gotten to that place where you have started to, to have questions and have begun to feel things and be like, hey, I see people around me have boyfriends and girlfriends. Should I have a boyfriend and girlfriend? And I've heard things that some people are doing when they have boyfriends and girlfriends. Am I supposed to do that? Someone told me I should be doing that. And, and this pressure can begin to mount. And so like I said, I want to give you a framework from God of, of how to think about this rightly. And so we're gonna spend the next few weeks looking at a lot of topics. We're gonna talk today about God's design for, for sex and relationship and, and listen that because God is the author of it, he knows how it works best and he's actually given us uh, some instruction for how to operate in it. And then uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about things like boundaries and relationships. We're, we're gonna talk about, hey, how do we respond to uh, people who are same-sex attracted? How do we respond to issues of LGBTQ+, whatever letter you want to identify with there? What, what am I supposed to do about it? I've heard that the, the church doesn't like those people. Is that true? Does God not love those people? Well, what am I supposed to do with this? And I want us to, to look at God's word and so that we can see the character of God and what his word says, and we can see these things rightly. And so to, today we're gonna go back to the very beginning. We're gonna open up in Genesis chapter one, verse 27. And, and here's what we're gonna see here, that sex was God's idea. It says, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so here's what I want you to see, what the Bible is saying here is that God created man and God created woman. And when God created man and woman, the, the idea of sex and sexuality was already created with that. Like the, the male and female anatomy had already been created. God didn't like turn away and come back and be like, where did you get those? I didn't do that. No, God created it. And here is the basis for everything I am going to say today. 
So I want you to lean in and listen to it. Because God created it, he is in control of it and he knows how it works best. Man, I want you to hear that. Because he is the author of it. He, he knows where it is safest and he knows where it is best. And also, so if, if sex was God's idea, that means that attraction and desire for sexual relationships is also God's idea, that he has wired us in such a way that we would begin to feel things. And, and maybe some of you have already started experiencing that. The, there is a period of time where the, the church said sex is just for procreation. It's just for making babies and that's it. You shouldn't enjoy it. It's not, it's not good. And I feel like if we look and, and where we're gonna look at scripture today, we're gonna see that that's not entirely true. That yes, God, God did create it for us to multiply, but he also created it for us to enjoy he says, be, be fruitful. It's this idea of, of eating and enjoying something. He says, hey, I want you to enjoy this. I want you to multiply. I've given you a good gift, um, but it has boundaries. And so today we're gonna dive into a book of scripture that we don't uh, really go to a lot called the Song of Solomon. And, and this is kind of a, a love letter, a love story, a love song, if you will. Um, between King Solomon and, and, and this woman who, who he is infatuated with, he is in love with, and they are kind of riding back and forth to each other. And uh, it, it's, it's very hard to understand. Uh, it's a lot of poetic language, uh, a lot of imagery, but we can pull some stuff on it. And so many people look at it and be like, man, this is so weird. I'm like, have you actually listened to the lyrics of songs? Like, have you actually listened to the lyrics of songs? So I have a couple. I remember when I was in, in high school, um, there, there was a, a, a style of music that came out, which is modernly known as emo music. Uh, it's called emotional. It's because it's emotional music. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I was all about it. I was, I was all about it. You see, I had, I had all of these feelings pent up inside of me and no, no framework and, and somehow songs could just put words better than I could put it myself. Uh, one, one song, uh, Dashboard Confessional, uh, maybe some of our uh, people my, my, my age is will, will remember Dashboard Confessional. So here, here I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you something. There is a time that existed where there's a thing called a ringback tone. Does anyone know what a ringback tone is? My leaders, do you remember spending money so that when someone called you, they, instead of listening to a ringtone, they would listen to a song. Give it like five or 10 year students. It's gonna come back and you're gonna be like, this is such a great idea. Why hasn't anyone thought of it before? They did. But, but this was the, the song I had as my ringback tone. Uh, and so he, here are some of the lyrics. Breathe in for luck, breathe in so deep. This air is blessed you share with me. This night is wild, so calm and dull. These hearts they race from self-control. Your legs are smooth as they grace mine. We're doing fine. We are doing nothing at all. My hopes are so high that your kiss might kill me. So won't you kill me so I die happy? <laughs> and so for me, as a, a young man with all of these feelings, I was like, man, just kiss me, right? I'll die, I'll die happy, all right? Will someone just kiss me, right? And you're looking like, man, songs were so dumb back then, all right? Here's, here's a little Ed Sheeran for, for people who are more current, more current music. We are still kids, but we're so in love, fighting against all odds. I know we'll be all right this time. Darling, just hold my hand, be my girl. I'll be your man. I see my future in your eyes. Listen, there's something uh, about music and the words that they put uh, words to it and that it has imagery and it captures things that we feel that sometimes we can't just communicate. And, and that is the purpose behind this book, that as we begin to read it, uh, it is going to communicate things in a way that's just different than we would communicate. So, so here's a couple of things I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you for just a little bit of maturity, all right? 
as we read this, that, that, that you could be a little bit mature as, as we say, read some of the things that are in here and, and that we would lean in and learn what God has because as we read this song that these people write to each other, we actually learn a lot about how God designed relationships and how he wants us to operate in them. We good, can we do that? So uh, as we look at this relationship, I want you to think about this as a plane, this, a plane flying over. This is a 30,000 view, really fast going through uh, this, this book and this relationship. Next year, I'd actually like to spend our whole relationship series just going through it because I believe it's so valuable, but I am going to, to jet through this really fast. So we're gonna, we're gonna open it up in Song of Solomon, chapter one, verse two and three. And here is the first thing that we see that as desire and attraction build up in us and they, they land on a particular person, that we begin to feel these feelings, that the, the first step we should do in the relationship process is we should begin to evaluate that person. So we'll open up Song of Solomon's chapter one, verse two. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant and your name is oil poured out. Therefore, virgins love you. So the, the person talking in this part right here is, is the, the woman. She's known to us as the, the Shumalite woman. This is the, the object of King Solomon's love as this story. And we really begin to sing the beginning of this relationship. And what she is saying here is she's saying, I have some feelings, right? Like she has caught some feelings here. She's like, I see your face and I like it. I see your lips. I want my lips on your lips. These are the things that she is feeling here. She says, your, your anointing oils are sprays. And she's like, you've sprayed yourself up with that ax body spray. And I just enjoy being around you, right? She, she enjoys just being around him, the, the smell, right? But, th- but then it gives us something important here. She says, your name is oil poured out. You see, something that we learn about name through, through really a lot of scripture and other of Solomon's writings is that name is equivalent with character. And so when she says that your name is an oil poured out, she's saying that besides the, the things I am attracted uh, to you about, the thing I am most attracted to you about is your character. The thing I am most attracted to you about is your character. I'm not sure if you've ever thought about that, that, that as our desires and as our attraction begins to land on a person, the next natural step in that process is to begin to evaluate that person's character. Yes, I like this person, but they are they the type of person I should be with? I mean, do they treat people well? Do they speak kindly to others? Are they honest, humble, patient? What type of person are they? I mean, if I wasn't around, would they act the same way? What would they say about me? How would they talk about me? The, the, the evaluative questions begin to come out. So I, I want to ask you, maybe for you, you have a crush, right? You've caught some feelings. H- have you ever stopped to evaluate someone's character? What type of person are they? Man, so many times uh, as a relationship begins to grow, um, you realize because you never stop to evaluate character, man, this isn't really a good person. Why, why am I with them? And, and they, they never stop to evaluate and ask themselves the question, what kind of person is this? Uh, Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs in uh, Proverbs 22, he says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold. He says, hey, your name, your reputation, what people think about you, what you are known for, your character, how you operate when no one is around is the most valuable thing about you. It says more than riches or gold, your character is valuable. It says, the, therefore the young virgins love you. This isn't a, a a comment on their sexual status. This word young virgins in their context just means a young woman. Uh, The the best way we can interpret this is this means she's been talking to her friends and they approve, right? 
Right, she's been going around, she's like, oh, King Solomon, he's so cute. Man, I just like him. We, we were, you know, sending pigeon letters the other day and, and he just wrote me this sweet thing. And oh my gosh, I'm feeling, she's like, you know what? I saw him the other day and someone needed help. And man, he just, in one moment, he stepped in and helped that person. Man, hey, I, I've heard how he talks about people and I've seen how he treats people when, when nothing is advantageous to him. And, and man, he is a good person. And it's this idea that, that not only should you be evaluating someone who you are attracted to, someone who maybe you are bu- building a relationship, but you should have people in your life who you trust and you listen to that are able to speak into that as well. She's like, hey, not only do I approve of you, but my friends approve of you as well. To, to quote the Spice Girls, if you wanna get with me, you gotta get with my friends. Um, I know all of the students don't know what that is, but all my leaders just appreciated everything I said. Um, but yeah, the, the, the people closest to you should affirm this. They should affirm the character that they see in that person. They should say, hey, this is someone I want you to spend time with. This is, this is how they treat you. This is how they treat others. And, and as we, we see this relationship begin to grow, we see that, hey, I, I'm attracted to you. Hey, I like you. And I, I've begun the process of evaluating, are you the type of person that I could be with? Because, because before we let this relationship grow, before we become, I'm not sure what the term that, that you guys would use when I was growing up, it was Facebook official. Um, so I tried to ask around, I couldn't really find it, but whatever the point is where someone becomes official, like, hey, we're, we're an item, we're a thing, whatever that is, I, I need to, to stop for a second and evaluate some character. Is this the type of person I should be with? And something else I feel like is important that I wanted to mention is that, that sometimes in the evaluation process, the natural conclusion of that is that this isn't a good relationship. Maybe we should break up. I feel like breaking up has such a negative connotation that it's just this devastating thing that someone has to do something just horrible for us to break up. No, sometimes you're just evaluating and you come to the understanding that this isn't someone that you should be with. This isn't someone of good character. This isn't someone that has the character that can sustain the type of relationship that I want. And if they can't check those boxes, the natural conclusion of that is to end it before that relationship grows. And this is actually good to, here's something, um, I'm probably gonna break some hearts right now, but statistically speaking, you will not meet the person that you're going to marry while you're in school. I'm I'm sorry, I I know I'm gonna break break some hearts. And I, I know we have some people in the room uh, that, that, that are high school sweethearts, some of our adult leaders, uh, you're, you're in the 2% category. That's the t- t- statistic. 2% out of 100, all right? It's not like two out of 10. No, 2% out of 100. So 98% of people, if we had 100 people in this room, which we might be close to that, I don't know, uh, two people could raise their hand and said, hey, I'm the, I'm the 2%, right? That's not the majority, And so if you are in a dating relationship right now and you're already sensing some issues of character that is causing you to pause, if you're already sensing some red flags, sometimes the best thing you can do is to go ahead and let that naturally end right now before that relationship grows. Here's what I want you to know. Here's my first point for you. Desire for a relationship is natural and good. Desire for a relationship is natural and good. God created us this way, that that we would would have the desire to to have companionship, that we would have the desire to be close to someone, that we would have the desire to know someone else and be known by someone else. And that is natural and good. And the reason that evaluating character is so important is the longer that that relationship goes on, the more important the character that they have is. The more that they'll, they'll need character to sustain that relationship. And this is what we see in our, our couple, that as their relationship grew, 
as their attraction and desire for each other grew, they had to have the character to sustain it. And eventually the the relationship needed to have some depth. Like it couldn't just stay surface level. It had to have some depth. There had to be a point in time where that relationship, where you felt safe enough to, to share some of your hurts where you felt safe enough to share some of your insecurities, where you, you felt safe enough to share some of your goals, some of your dreams, who you wanted to be, what God's calling you to do, that, that there is some depth to this relationship. This is what we see in verse 15. Now Solomon is, is writing to this girl, he, he is really digging. He says, behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. The, the, the dove was a symbol of, of peace. And so he's saying, hey, you, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. But more than that, you are my safe place. You are not a, a place I have to, to worry about being vulnerable. You are not a, a place that I have to uh, guard my feelings. I have known you and I have evaluated your character and I have gotten to a place where I can be real with you. You can know the real me. You, you wanna know the most exhausting and unsatisfying relationship you can ever have? A toxic one? I have something better for you. One where you're, you're faking it. What, what the most unsatisfying relationship you can ever have is where you have to pretend to be something that you're not because you can never be real with that person. And therefore you're never fully known and never feel fully accepted and never feel fully loved. There there has to be over a period of time as that character is observed and as that relationship grows that you're able to say, hey, you are a safe place for me. And then we we see this in in her response. Uh, As the the story continues, she begins to speak about some of her insecurities. She she begins to talk about the color of her skin. And she says, hey, I I grew up, I didn't grow up in the palace, like like all the princesses and all the other girls. She's like, I I, I had to work for my family. My my skin is dark. I've I've been out in the sun. Uh, In that time period, being tan was was a, a symbol of being a lower like class, like a working class person because you had to be out in the sun. If your skin was pale, that meant, hey, you, you were nobility because you didn't have to go out in the sun and work. Everything was taken care of for you. And so she began speaking some of her insecurities and says, hey, like I, I, I'm a little bit insecure about my skin and, and how you feel about me and how if people see us together that they're gonna think you're so much better for me. And, and she begins to speak all of these insecurities. And she says, she says hey, I'm, I'm just a lily in the field. I, I am just I am just one flower in a field of flowers. And he speaks specifically to her insecurities. He says, a lily in the field? No, he says, a lily among the brambles, a lily among the thorns, so is my love among the other women. You see, they had become a safe place for each other where he was able to speak specifically into her insecurities and say, hey, I, I see what hurts you. I see the fears you have and I want to validate you in this moment. I want, I want to, to show you how much I care for you. Man, I want to speak into those things and speak affirmation and speak truth. I want you to know exactly how I see you and how I view you. Listen, this is why evaluation is so important. Because we hear things like that and we hear things like, man, we want it to be this safe place and we want to be vulnerable and we want to speak truth and we want to speak affirmation. And that doesn't happen if you have the wrong kind of character. The more vulnerable you are and the more open you are, people will take that information and use it against you. People will take that information to control you. People will take that information to abuse you if they don't have the type of character to sustain the right type of relationship. And so many times we we have this Instagram view of relationship. Like all we see is the pics of us sharing a meal on a date or all we see is us at the beach or all we see is this and it's this Instagram relationship and it never got deep. There was never depth to a relationship. There was never character that was able to sustain it. And that is dangerous. And this is where our authors of this story give us a warning. In Solomon chapter two, verse seven, 
She says, I assure you, this, that's the word plead. She is begging. She says, hey, I am pleading with you. I am begging with you. I want you to know, daughters of Jeru Jerusalem, young men, young women by the gazelles and the does of the field, that you not stir up our awakened love until it pleases. She is saying, God has created this thing and he has put some boundaries around it to protect you. And if you are in the wrong type of relationship or you try to rush the wrong type of things in the relationship, you are in danger. Don't do it. Here's my, my second point for you. As a relationship grows, so does the risk. As the relationship grows, so does the risk. You see, as their, their relationship grows, they, they get to the point where, where, where they're, they're growing in a relationship. They're actually in the process of getting ready to be married and, and their love is growing for each other and their feelings are growing for each other. And they realize that there is a risk to ruin this thing that God is growing. You know, they, they refer to a lot of uh, flower imagery in this. And it talks about the, blood, the bud of a flower, that their relationship uh, is a bud waiting to be bloomed. And, and they say, hey, it is in this infant stage. Our, our relationship is like a flower. It is so fragile. And we don't want to do anything that runs the risk of ruining what God is working in here and what God is building in here and this intimacy that he is trying to grow. And so, so they, they, they see a risk in Solomon chapter two, verse 14. He writes, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Say, hey, I, I wanna see you. I wanna hear you. I want to be around you. And then comes a warning. Catch the foxes for us the little foxes that spoil the vineyards for our vineyards are in blossom. See, it's saying as their feelings are beginning to grow, their feelings are beginning to blossom and they are running the risk of ruining this thing that God has, has been building, of, of breaking this thing that God is growing, that, that the, the risk and the danger of getting too physical too fast and operating outside of the way that God has created to be. We look around the world and it says, no, this is good and this is right. Yet God comes and says, hey, actually it is dangerous. Slow down, be cautious. I want you to be safe. I am trying to protect you. It uses the imagery of a fox and the the fox, as it comes to a vineyard, they, they come in and they steal and they destroy. He says, there, there is a danger of a fox coming in and stealing and trying to destroy what God is trying to grow in your relationship. I was uh, listening to a documentary on foxes. I'm not sure if you guys watch a lot of documentaries, particularly about foxes, but uh, there I was watching it. And... Uh, they pose the question, what does the fox say, right? And in this investigative journey, through a lot of study and hard research, they, they figured it out. Ring, ding, ding, da, ding, da, ding. <laughs> Wah, pa, 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 pow. Hotty, 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 ho, right? Through much investigative journalism and documentary work, they were able to put together a video capturing the true sounds of a fox, you see, it, the, the question that the song poses is what does the fox say? I feel like we need to ask the same question. It says the fox is trying to steal and is trying to kill and destroy what God is, is growing in this relationship. And what does the fox say? Yeah, when, when it comes to our, belief, our relationships, I believe the fox says that it's okay to do whatever you want. It doesn't care about the safety of your relationship. It doesn't care about what God's trying to grow. It doesn't care about the boundaries that he's put in place to protect you. The fox says, hey, everyone else is doing it. It's okay. The fox says the risk is worth it. Maybe for you, the fox is saying, hey, well, we're probably gonna get married anyways. So it's okay. What's, where's the risk? What's the worry? 
And, and here I believe are, are two risk warnings that we see where we're at in this story. The first one, if you're taking notes, it's not gonna be up on the screen, but I believe it's important for you. Don't get in a relationship with someone that doesn't have the character to love you well. Don't get into a relationship with someone who does not have the character to love you well. And the second one, don't ruin the intimacy that God is trying to grow by letting it get too physical. Don't ruin the intimacy that God is trying to go, grow by letting it get too physical. You see, here is, here is what happens. This is why there are warnings. This is why he's saying it's dangerous because he's saying, hey, the reason there's a warning is because there's something on the other side that I'm warning against. And this is my, my next point for you. Letting our feelings control our actions is not God's best for us. Letting our feelings control our actions is not God's best for us. We see Paul write to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17. He says, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Man, I, I want you guys to lean in for a second and hear, hear what I have to say. Guys in the room, look at me. In your relationships, you have the ability to operate in self-control. Girls in the room, look at me. In your relationships, you have the ability to operate in self-control. We don't have to let our feelings dictate our actions. And that, that's what we see in, in this story that they begin to say, hey, there is danger there is risk and they, they have warnings. Actually, three times uh, it says, I assure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and the does of the field, do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. And what we see is that as their relationship grows, we see them get married and we, we see them, them uh, uh, write about their, their marriage night and how they were able to celebrate all that God had protected and all that God had brought in. And uh, we, we see their relationship continue. We, we see a, a picture into their first fight and how they navigated conflict. And, and kind of at, at the end of the story, almost looking back, we see the warning again for the third time in Solomon chapter eight, verse four. It says, I assure you, I plead with you, I beg of you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you not stir up our awakened love until it pleases. And that's the warning. He says, do not rush this. He says, don't get so caught up in your feelings that you begin to do things that are not in your best interest and not God's best for you. I love the way Andy Stanley uh, says this. He says, relationships are wonderful and powerful. Wonderful enough that they are worth pursuing but powerful enough that they need to be respected. Here's the problem that I see in our culture right now is that we have elevated sex and, and physical acts in a relationship and we've placed it on this pedestal, that it is now the goal. It's not about being known or knowing someone else or, or growing in intimacy. It's just what's the next physical barrier I need to get through? What's the next thing on the checklist that I need to check off? The danger is, is that we have the, the potential to let the physical part of a relationship be the most important thing in our lives, that it, sex becomes a God to us, that it, it takes the place as the most important thing in our lives and we will do anything to get it, regardless of the risk, regardless of the warning. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians chapter three he actually warns about this mindset of where we let our desires dictate our actions. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemy of the cross of Christ. Don't miss this. He says, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame and their minds are set on heavenly things. He says, but us, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, 
the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him and even to subject himself to all things. You see, it says here that when we let our our desires dictate our actions and, and influence us and make our decisions for us, it says our God is our belly. In the, the Hebrew mindset, the belly was the place of desire. It's, it's really where we even get the idea of like a, a gut feeling. That what you feel is right. And so, so what you feel dictates what you do. He says their God is their belly, their belly and they glory in their shame. They said, not only do they just do what they want to, what they think is best. He says they glory in it. Man, and that's what you see all around here. People celebrating their body counts and how many people they've been with and and what they do in their relationship and bragging about it to other people. And Paul here is saying, man, I weep for these people. I'm brokenhearted over these people because they're missing out on what God has for them. He said, they're walking into destruction and they don't even know it. They think what they know is best and they're, they're missing out, not only on the God who created all of it and wants good for you, but they're missing out on the way that God designed it and put boundaries around it for your good. He has given us a good gift. And so many people just try to find their value in, in what they do in a relationship. Their value is determined by what they can do with their body. Can I tell you, you are so much more valuable than that. And God loves you way too much to just let you do what you want to without instructing you that there is a better way I don't want you to miss out on what he has for you. My last point for you is relationship goal number one. Sex and relationships were created to be good, but not to be God's. Sex was never meant to be a God. Sex was never meant to be the most important part of of your relationship. It was designed to bring you closer to someone and in doing that, bring you closer to God. And he says, but that doesn't happen outside of the the protective place that I've set it in, outside of a, a marriage relationships where it is safe and that character has been evaluated. And the warning for you is don't rush this. There is danger, there, there is risk involved. And you don't wanna rush into this too fast. Listen, your your boyfriend was never meant to be a God. Your girlfriend was never meant to be a God. God was meant to be your God. And he is good and he is the only one that can satisfy you. You wanna know the best way to ruin a relationship? Make that person your God. Make everything about that person and then watch them fail you. And you realize, hey, there's something broken. I feel like there's something I'm missing out on. And God is saying it was never meant to fully satisfy you. I was meant to fully satisfy you. So many people have let their desires become the authority in their life. And what they feel is what they decide is true. And we're gonna get more into that as we continue on in the series, but man, The warning that I have for you today is is don't stir it up. Don't rush this process that God has created, that the feelings that you have are real and the feelings that you have are good, but they're not always true. And they're not always right. And God has put boundaries around it, not to take from you, but to protect you and to give life to you. God is is not out there trying to be the ultimate killjoy and take good things from you. We talked about it at the beginning. He created it. 
He wants you to enjoy his good gift of relationships and and ultimately sex. But he says, outside of the way that I created it, it no longer is a good gift. It's actually very dangerous for you. So don't rush it. Like I said earlier, it, it, it is wonderful enough that it is worth pursuing but powerful enough and dangerous enough that it needs to be respected and protected. Don't rush it, students. And don't miss out on all that God has for you. By buying into the lie that all you need to do is just engage in the physical acts of a relationship and all you need to do is just have sex. And then that will, that will get you what you want. It's a lie, it's not true. And God loves you too much to let you walk out of this room without hearing that that is a lie and that he has something better for you. Pray with me.